Rose Cooper said a few months ago a pushy woman with brown hair and glasses started asking for the Rose Cooper painting. Charles assumes it's Cindy Kenny. But could Rose Cooper have been talking about Poppy? Why would Cinda or Poppy want the Rose Cooper painting? Did Cinda or Poppy poison Winnie the dog? Did Alice paint the forgery of the Rose Cooper painting? The person who broke into Charles' apartment in the blackout has to be Marv, right? They have the exact same flashlight. Why was Bunny in Mabel's apartment when she was killed? How did Howard get a black eye? Is Kreps planting evidence or destroying evidence? Jan said the killer composed the murder scene. A storyteller, like a podcast host. An artist, like a painter. An artist never finishes their piece in the middle. They stick with it till the end, finding a way to stay close to their work. Is someone staying close to you? Does someone have a new friend? That's your killer. Let's solve Only Murders in the Building. Season 2, Episode 9, Sparring Partners. We'll be breaking down... Wait, wait, wait. What a twist at the end! Holy smokes! Where is Becky? Well, she's right here. Oh my goodness. Wow. What did you guys think? We'll be breaking down each episode for clues, suspects, and red herrings on our hunt to learn. Who killed Bunny Folger? Spoilers for the first season of Only Murders in the Building and the first nine episodes, 90% of the second season. If you haven't seen all 19 episodes, pause this video, watch the first nine episodes of season two. After watching all that TV, you'll probably look like Nick Nolte at the Mardi Gras, but do it. You've got to do it so we can go over these clues and learn who killed Bunny. Let me really quickly talk about spoilers and say that I don't really go on Reddit much because I don't want to consciously or unconsciously steal somebody else's theory. I like to present my own theories or the theories that I get as feedback from you guys and I state when I get them from somebody else. But I do go on Reddit occasionally to make sure I haven't missed a clue. Once again, the folks on Reddit are claiming the killer's identity has been leaked. These people who have these screeners, which I'm not one of, they had access to the final two episodes and people have been leaking spoilers and leaking clues left and right. I didn't get the final two episodes. I do not know who the killer is. When you hear all my theories and clues, you'll know I don't know who the killer is. And so I want you to know that everything presented in this video is completely spoiler free. If we stumble into the correct answer or we assume something that turns out to be true, know that it is an assumption. No spoilers from anybody who's watched episode 10 in this video. And if you've seen episode 10, I think you'll be able to laugh at all my poor guesses and theories in this episode. In this video, I'm going to present a what if theory. It's a solution to the crime that works with the who, how, why, and why now, but it may not be an especially satisfying ending. In fact, it may be completely irrelevant after this most recent episode, but I'm still going to present it to you to find out, would you be happy with this solution? Because I think there are a handful of solutions that could work this season, and I want to know what type of solution do you need to be satisfied with season two? We're going to review the suspects, break down your feedback, and I'm going to end this podcast with my final theory of who killed Bunny Folger and what's going on inside the Arconia. Let's begin with the double C credit clues. Opening credits, Bunny's walking a chicken. Forget a dog. <laughs> Forget walking Mrs. Gambolini. Bunny is walking a chicken. In the closing credits, we see Alice's artwork, where we see Mabel in the Frida Kahlo painting, as well as the back of the Rose Cooper painting, Savage 56. Before we get to news, let's just talk about some housekeeping. On Sunday, April 21st, HBO debuts their successor show to Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon. As I mentioned before, HBO was kind enough to invite us to the red carpet world premiere in Hollywood. And we have our spoiler-free podcast on that first episode up. Check it out right now. Tied to that, we'll be coming out with our after show podcast next Monday, August 22nd. A spoiler field take on that first episode. And we'll be doing it every week. If you like Game of Thrones, I'm pretty sure you're going to like House of the Dragon. And we invite you to join us on the Joffrey of Podcast Feeds. It is a much lighter and sillier take than most after show podcasts. So I hope you'll join us. I want you to note that getting that podcast out 
is going to tie in to the podcast on episode 10 of season two of Only Murders in the Building. Not just working on our new House of the Dragon podcast, but believe it or not, my work is making me come back to the office on Tuesday, August 23rd, 2022. That's right. The day the final episode of Only Murders in the Building premieres, I've got to actually go back into the office and work for the first time since this COVID pandemic started. And I'm going to need your help with coverage of Only Murders in the Building, Episode 10. Normally, I can watch the episode, I can review it, I can come up with clues and theories, look into Season 3, talk about the solution to who killed money. But I'm going to have less time because i got to go into the office and actually do work. So, hey, I'm going to need your help. After you watch Episode 10, tweet at me at Double PHQ. That's the word double, the single letter P for podcast, HQ for headquarters, at Double PHQ on Twitter, as well as Instagram. Facebook.com slash double P H Q. You can email us hello at double P media.com. All your lingering thoughts on season two, as well as your questions for season three. After you watch episode 10, I need your help. Now, speaking of season three, recently, this podcast has been averaging about 13,000 views on YouTube, which is wonderful. But if you look, sadly, we only have 2,000 subscribers. I'm not good at math, but that means about 11,000 viewers aren't subscribers. YouTube is bad that way. If I don't have a lot of subscribers, the algorithm hates me. So hey, this is the goal. The most likes we've ever gotten on a YouTube video is 786. Arconiacs, help me break that record so we're going to get more likes on this video than we've ever had before. I also need you to subscribe. Even if you're not into the after show that we do on other TV shows, I still need you to subscribe or the YouTube algorithm hates us. One positive thing is if you do subscribe, when season three rolls around, I think you'll be able to join us right at the beginning as we continue our hunt to catch these Arconia killers. Now, as we wait for season three, I mentioned I'm going to be doing after show podcasts on the House of the Dragon. In September 2022, we'll have our after show podcast about Andor, as well as Double M is going to be talking The Lord of the Rings. After that, we'll have after show podcasts about Netflix's 1899 the follow-up show from the creators of Dark. In November, we'll be covering Netflix's The Crown, season five, as well as later this year or early 2023, the fourth season of the German language hit Babylon Berlin. Plus, we'll probably see the return of His Dark Materials in February 2023. We'll be doing after shows about The Mandalorian. We invite you to join us in these light, fun after show podcasts that we do here at Double PHQ. And if you love this Let's Solve series and you're here in the United States, on October 17th, we're going to start our weekly coverage of the murder mystery Magpie Murders with Let's Solve Magpie Murders. It'll be airing in the United States on PBS. Everybody else in the world can watch it and then watch our Let's Solve series and see how wrong we are. Okay, let's get to a what if theory. And once again, most likely this will not be the final solution to the puzzle, but it's a what if theory that does answer the who, the how, the why, and the why now. Are we gonna get that from the actual solution? (laughs) Let's see. And this what if theory is really not to judge the theory so much, but how you would react to it. So I'm going to provide a what if theory, and I want you guys to respond down in the comments, shoot to us on social media at Double PHQ. If you think this is a good solution, if you'd be happy with this solution, or you think you will not be satisfied with this solution. So here's our first what if theory on season two. Arconia building manager Ursula is always running a scam. You've seen it before as she pitches residents on the wonders of gut milk and how they should buy it and help her distribute it. Now let's imagine a theory where Ursula's even worse. One of those scams is ripping off the Arconia. She has Bunny sign off on payments for elevator inspectors who don't actually exist. Bunny writes off on the payment, Ursula pockets that money for herself, and the elevators don't get repaired. It's currently a perfect scam because Bunny's about to retire and leave for Boca, while the incoming board president, Nina, is way too focused on a rooftop project. She's not going to be looking too closely at the current books, which Ursula is scamming the building and its residents out of thousands. But then suddenly, Bunny decides to unretire, and she calls Ursula and says she wants to go over the books, and specifically that elevator repairman invoice. Ursula realizes she is screwed. What could she do? With one look at the books, Bunny would easily figure out that Ursula's been scamming them. 
what is she going to do? Well, she's got to stop Bunny by any means necessary. Now, she does have some advantages to do this. As building manager, she knows all about secret passageways that allow her to get around the building. She also has a secret weapon. Earlier in the courtyard, the podcast hosts were having a party, and Oliver left behind a knife, which he and his podcast buddies were using to cut a cake. So Ursula now has a weapon. There's one problem. If she wants to take out Bunny, there's this neighbor across the hall. She's one of the podcasters who helped crack the Tim Kono case. She needs these people out of the way. She can't let anyone know what she's up to. So she develops a plan. She'll frame the girl across the hall who might overhear her killing Bunny for the crime. Ursula kills Bunny. After she kills Bunny, the final thing she has to do is throw out all the evidence of her stealing from the Harkonia. And she throws it out in the dumpster. For whatever reason, those podcast hosts aren't immediately arrested. So Ursula has to plant evidence against them, specifically Charles, the one she hates the most. Okay, what do you guys think of that what-if theory? That Ursula theory is probably not the correct theory, right? It doesn't touch on 14 or Savage, and I should point out, it's not factually correct. The cake knife is not the murder knife. The cake knife has a black handle while the murder knife has three stripes on the handle. But that is a solution. Would you be happy with the Ursula Killed Bunny solution? Write down in the comments and let us know. Before we run down the suspects, let's see what episode nine taught us about the victim, Arconia board president, Bunny Fulcher. Bunny must know Rose Cooper because Rose Cooper tells Charles that recently, a brown-haired woman with glasses who was pushy had been asking for the painting. How would Rose Cooper know about that if Bunny hadn't told her? Bunny did have a replica of the painting made, a forgery, if you will, and hid the original painting inside the stand that held Mrs. Gambolini's cage. Did she do this because the pushy woman had recently started asking about the painting? What do you guys think? All right, let's get to the suspects. And up top is one who I've never truly considered, but it's Cinda Cannon. Cinda met Kreps at the Chicken Chug Bar and Grill, and they flirted over a Chicken Chug Wings Tub. And she got him to help her with the evidence for her podcast, All Is Not Okay, in Oklahoma. Cindy Canning fits the profile of brown hair and glasses and pushy. Why would Cinda want the Rose Cooper painting? I think maybe you could assume, and note you have to assume where the clues show, but you could assume that after All Is Not Okay in Oklahoma's success, Cinda wants to do another podcast about another missing woman. And the famed artist Rose Cooper is a famous missing woman. So how would Cinda know about the secret passageways in the Arconia? Uh, what do you guys think? Guys, I need your help more than ever. How could Cinda know about the secret passageways? Is it possible Kreps helped out on the Tim Kono case and discovered them? Eh, but an even better question. Why kill Bunny? Because Bunny wouldn't hand over a painting that she wanted to do a podcast on? Uh, That is a very flimsy, very flimsy motive. But okay, let's say Cinda needs this painting for reasons we can't figure out. Bunny is about to leave to Boca. Cindy wouldn't have access to the painting anymore, so she wouldn't have a subject for her Dex podcast. And as we know from her big sale, she's getting rich off selling her podcast and doing her podcast. But does it have to be specifically about this painting? What are we missing? Now, why would Cinda plant the painting in Charles's apartment? Why would she use knitting needles to frame Mabel and use Oliver's knife? Well, this we can assume, and I think this is a safe assumption, not one that uh, maybe stretches what the show asks us to do, is that Cinda wouldn't want any competition for her upcoming podcast. These guys are on the front cover of newspapers and magazines. She's got to get rid of her competition so she can still make that $30 million. Would Cinda have poisoned Winnie the dog and the threatening note to Oliver that reads, Stop the podcast? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, at the point that this happened back in season one, our podcast trio didn't really have many listeners or downloads to their podcast, and they hadn't even met Cindy Canning in person yet. I really don't think she could have poisoned Winnie the dog, do you? Would Cinda kill for a podcast? I'm having trouble seeing it, but there may be another item in this that I can't figure out. Please give those comments and let's do it. 
Poppy White, <laughs> excuse me, Becky Butler. The clues that Becky Butler was Poppy. Let's go over them because in some ways I think they're as brilliant as the bassoon clues. Rose Cooper was a story of a woman who faked her own death to get away from a man. And should that have led viewers to wonder if another character had faked their own death? In Season 2, Episode 5, Poppy sits beneath a poster of All Is Not Okay in Oklahoma, which reads the question, Where is Becky Butler? Well, she's sitting here in the shot. As we pointed out before, the other poster is Knife Girl. Is that a sign Poppy's the killer? Poppy knew the correct pronunciation of Chickasha, where Cinda Canning didn't. Cinda also whistled at Poppy as if she was calling the dog named Bo, who had Becky's panties in its mouth. So those are pretty darn good clues. Of course, the next question is, how does any of that tie into Bunny Folger and the Rose Cooper painting? Once again, I've got no idea. Give this video a like if you have no idea. This video needs likes, I'm kidding. <laughs> Rose Cooper escaped to Upper New York State, not Oklahoma. What is the tie-in here? Now, Poppy claims she can't do anything else for Mabel because she claims she's afraid of Cinda. Poppy could be characterized as a brown-haired woman with glasses. Why would Poppy want the Rose Cooper painting? Why would Poppy kill Bunny for the painting? Why would Poppy plant the painting in Charles' apartment, use knitting needles to frame Mabel, and use Oliver's knife? I could see Cindy Canning not wanting competition from the podcast trio, but Poppy slash Becky not wanting competition? Eh. Again, what am I missing? What could be the motive? Haven't we asked that an awful lot on this podcast through two seasons? Superfan Marv. Now, Marv wasn't in this episode, but as I pointed out last week, it's his flashlight that breaks through Charles's door into the apartment. In Charles's bathroom, we see his flashlight in one hand and the knife in the other, and that person walk into the secret passage. Now, Marv is probably too young, if Marv is supposed to be around the actor's age of 52 to 54. He's probably too young to be Cinda's dad. But could Marv be Poppy's dad? Well, he could be. But both Marv and Poppy were in the courtyard at the end of season one, and they didn't acknowledge each other in the scene we saw. Don't you think if that had been Marv's daughter in the courtyard, he would have been trying to connect with her if she was? Howard Morris. Now you guys know Howard's black eye is a missing mystery, and we don't imagine that Nina actually punched Howard like his last explanation was. Let's assume Nina did punch Howard. Why would she have done it? Well, maybe she read this account from the Arconia board minutes. Oh my lanta, Nina just let this bitch have it. Oh, I've been begging all season long for Howard to not be the killer because he's so funny. And I suppose this episode is saying he isn't the killer. I still have my questions about a bunch of Howard's stuff, but fair enough. Now, last week we saw Howard flirt with Jonathan. A lot of people were suspicious of Jonathan because of his sneeze. The Art of Intuition wrote, I do think that Howard's love interest is sneaking into the passageway gaining information. Is he a spy for Nina or an undercover cop? Jonathan knew way too much. And the fact he acted like he didn't know about Howard's cat? Please, everyone in the building knows about Howard and his cat. John wrote, a couple of weeks ago, I said the whole, are you a cop or an actor? You look like an actor exchange was curious. Well, now we have Jonathan, who people assume is an actor, but could he be a cop? Charlie wrote, Jonathan's flashlight matches the sneezer's flashlight that Lucy saw when Bunny was killed. Teddy Demas. Teddy, as I think we've all known for quite a while, is Will's father. Teddy fooled around with Roberta twice in one night. Teddy and Oliver do have a nice moment in this episode where they bond over their fathers. Of course, I'm wondering, these characters have known each other since the 1970s. They really haven't talked about their fathers to each other? Now, Teddy claims his father was killed by a Korean bookie. That ties into gambling. And anytime you hear gambling, you think Mrs. Gambolini. Oliver demands Teddy never tell Will. This can't hold, correct? Teddy has to tell Will. Teddy has to be murdered and be our victim for season three. You would assume. Then, as I've said on previous podcasts, you would have suspects of certainly Oliver, Will, and Theo. Maybe more because of Teddy's crime connection. But there you go. 
Oliver's son, Will. Will is freaking out about The Wizard of Oz. Oh boy, has he heard about the upcoming remake. But Will is told that he has theater in his blood. Will's also apparently been freaking out because of this DNA test. Oliver says, you're my son. Does Will believe him? Alice Banks. Alice comes bearing the gift of a puzzle in a bag that's covered in paint. Certainly an option on the matchbook is that's red paint and not blood. Alice explains that she cut her hands by carving pieces of the puzzle during the blackout. Now maybe Alice is just too suspicious, but she went into the bathroom by herself. Is she planting more evidence? Have we ever seen what became of the video where she made of Mabel destroying that piece of art? Detective Kreps. In this episode, we find out once and for all, Kreps is glitter guy. He works at Coney Island because he needs the cash. He also worked in Chickasha, Oklahoma on the all is not okay case of Becky Butler. Kreps works out at the excessive force boxing gym in the Bronx. A police officer working out at excessive force. Subtle political commentary, omit B. Kreps claims the matchbook didn't have his fingerprints implying he wasn't the person who dropped it there on the night Bunny died. But Kreps also claims the matchbook is gone. Why would it be gone unless Kreps feared it had Cinda's fingerprints on it? Now, Kreps is a creepy bastard who hates terrible, unprofessional podcasts. I feel so seen. Kreps also points out that someone is trying to frame Mabel for the murder, but he implies that isn't him. Who could be trying to frame Mabel? Is it his girlfriend, Cinda? What do you guys think is going on here? Now, Lenora Folger, scratch that, Big Bunny, scratch that, Rose Cooper is in this episode. She lives in Lake Placid, New York. So many things have been talking about flip the pieces, angel and flip flops. I've been flipping things all season long. And I looked at Rose Cooper and I flipped that to say it's repossessor. Ridiculous, I know. Now, Rose Cooper gets her hands on the original in this episode. And underneath it is a picture she made of Charles and his father. Once again, she claims she had to escape her abusive husband and that Charles's father helped her out. Who was Becky trying to escape? The big three. And even before it was revealed, I wrote Oliver is lying to everyone about being Will's father. Greekish? Oh, we learn Oliver's father was a door-to-door salesman, a Willie Loman type. Charles Hayden Savage. He finally opens up his father's watch and he finds an address. Is it incredible that Rose Cooper has lived in this same house in Lake Placid all these years? Mabel Mora. Mabel was a great detective in this episode. What did you guys think? She also seemingly has broken up with Alice for good. Our third season, will it bring a third love interest for Mabel? What do you guys think? Write to us at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, facebook.com slash Double PHQ Hello at DoublePmedia.com or YouTube comments. We love them all. Let's get to your feedback. Got a couple emails. I want to hit them at the top. Melissa wrote, With the familiar themes and the consistent mentions of Oliver, impatiently, waiting for the DNA results to find out if Will is his son, I think the DNA results will play a larger role than viewers may think. It'll tell you if there are other relatives out there, and Oliver will find out he has another son. I think this son was conceived shortly before the divorce, and was raised without Oliver in his life, and therefore, it's a son who wants to get close to him. I think the new neighbor Jonathan, who reminds me a little of Will, could be that long-lost son out to get revenge or seek approval from his absentee father. Even Jonathan shares a talent for the theater like Oliver does. Jeff provided a different father-child relationship he wanted to propose, and that is Poppy envied the attention of Marv, her father, who gives attention to Mabel. And Poppy thought her podcast, White Noise, with your host Poppy White, would get his attention. We have another Marv is the father to Poppy comment. This from Zepha, who wrote, As for Marv's daughter, it would also make sense if Poppy is his daughter. Hence how his fascination and love of crime podcast starts and why he's obsessed with the 6th Avenue slasher. He's trying to solve it so his daughter Poppy would be proud of him. It's also why Poppy has decided to help the trio. Mm. Now Queen B is also looking at Marv. She wrote, I think Marv is the person who is waiting for Mabel in her apartment and the one who killed Bunny. I think Marv is the 6th Avenue Slasher. I also believe he's the person in Mabel's dream, 
which I've mentioned before, I believe is a repressed memory. She has blacked out the incident, and Marv's afraid one day she'll remember and expose him. Now, there's a different proposed person for Marv's daughter, and that comes from the house of Mia. They wrote, I think the daughter Marv is talking about is Detective Williams, or her wife. In season one, Detective Williams was always talking about loneliness. I wonder if Marv abandoned one of them as a child and was trying to get back into their life. It would also explain the wedding he wasn't invited to. Ooh. So we had a couple people pitch Marv as Detective Williams' father. Now, Marv, not to judge, but the actor really is only, I believe, 52 or 53. And somebody who's 52 or 53, let's say they had a kid when they were 25-ish, that would make their kid 27 at the oldest. And Detective Williams, not fair to judge, to me seems a bit old. But maybe. I like the theory. Now, some people are really focused on Glitter Guy Kreps. A user with the handle Zoned Gardening Tools wrote, Remember Detective Jurgensen in Season 1? He happened to be there in the dark when Detective Williams realized that the cell phone and drug analysis of Tim Kono hadn't been done. I think Kreps was having Jurgensen shadow Detective Williams to see what she discovered about the Tim Kono case. Hmm. G-H-D-U wrote, Jan said the killer is an artist who composed the murder scene. It's not Alice. It's Rose Cooper slash Lenora and her henchman. Lenora is Rose Cooper. There's a famous opera, Fidelio, written by Beethoven, where heroine Lenora is disguised under the name Fidelio. Remember someone called Bunny while she was on a walk and Bunny said, oh, it's you. I don't want to talk about the painting. Honestly, it sounds like a mother-daughter dialogue. Mother and daughter that don't really get along. Charles wrote, Listening to your videos is as much fun as actually watching Only Murders in the Building. Last week, I noted Glitter Guy was definitely a dude, and this week, we note the masked man chasing Lucy through the bowels of the Arconia is definitely left-handed. There has to be more than one bad guy this season. And where the hell is Detective Williams? She returns early from maternity leave to confiscate a vital piece of evidence, and no one has heard from her since. Charles continues to say, I live in a high-rise. We don't have a doorman, but we do have a staffed front desk, and I gotta say, the security at the Arconia is crap. I mean, that place is like a high-end bus station. Strangers coming and going at all hours. Lastly, based upon the date of construction, I'm betting the Arconia is largely built of wood. Has no one ever lived in a 100-year-old wooden building? Every step is likely to produce audible creaking. The very idea that you could slink through the corridors hidden behind plaster walls undetected is ludicrous. Well, Charles, remember, in Season 1, our good friend Dr. Grover Stanley did hear a lot of noise of people going through his apartment. Somebody mentioned the continuity flubs we see, and that's L. Terry 913 wrote, Mabel isn't wearing the green ring on her hand down in her apartment, but she is wearing it up on the roof, but then not wearing it again when she goes down from the roof into her apartment and finds money. L. Terry, I hope this is just a continuity flub and not a clue, because if it's a clue, it's too tricky to follow of, okay, she had the green ring only on the roof, not in her apartment. Okay, now it's time for the final theory, the final unified theory, who killed Bunny Folger? As you guys know, all season long, I've had Howard in my pole position. I think Howard did it. I had Marv as my number two, and I had Lucy as the third person. Now, why those three? Well, they were definitely keeping secrets, and they had more of a connection to the Arconia and to framing Charles, Mabel, and Oliver than anybody else. So they seemed the most logical. Do I stick with my initial picks and that proves I'm consistent? Or does it prove I'm hard-headed and can't accept new facts? There's another bit of this. And that is, I feel like I got the killer wrong in season one because I couldn't really figure out a motive for Jan. Now, when they announced Jan's motive in episode 10 of season one, I was very frustrated. I was like, where were these clues? And there really weren't any. But of course, I'm not going to worry about that this time because I can't figure out motive for anybody. So who do I think killed Bunny Folger? I think the show is telling me I've got a choice between Cinda and Poppy. I can't figure out a motive for either of them to kill Bunny that's satisfying. 
Bunny won't give me this painting so I can do a podcast subject really is a terrible motive. But I have a feeling they'll reveal some strange twist in episode 10, which will provide a reason why Cinda wanted that painting, why Poppy might want that painting. So, okay, there's one final bit of this. I am positive that's Marv's flashlight. He came into Charles's apartment wearing a mask with a big knife and not wearing his respirator. So, how can I tie these two things together? The show is telling me it's Poppy or Cinda. Yet, Marv definitely broke in. Marv has this daughter issue, but it seems certainly Cinda isn't his daughter, and Poppy has his daughter. God, I don't know which way to go. This is a fun, I guess. Uh, this is possibly fun as a thought experiment, but I don't know. To me, it's more logical if Cop Kreps isn't involved in an actual murder. He might do a lot of dirty stuff, but him being involved in actually killing somebody doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm going to say Poppy. Is Poppy Marv's daughter? Sure. Okay. Maybe that's the only way I can get these two facts to go with each other. Oh, this is the weakest theory I've ever given. Watch this one be correct. Hey, if you've watched all these videos, number one, thank you. This has been a great journey. We're going to talk about episode 10 and laugh at all my incorrect guesses next week. But please, let's get this video to the most likes ever. Let's get it over 800 likes. Thank you guys so much. And please, for the next week, drop your great theories in the comments. I'll talk to you then.